Let's talk about the gear you need. Let's talk about what's in our photo bag. The essentials you need are quite limited. A camera, lenses, a tripod and a flashlight. That's all the basics you'll need. No need for special lenses, special cameras or expensive lighting gear. Optional gear is limited to a cable or remote release and some small light modifiers, which we can easily craft ourselves. For most post-processing I use Lightroom and Photoshop, but actually any software using layers, masks and blending modes can be used. Let's start with the camera. Almost any digital camera will do. The only feature your camera needs is the ability to shoot long exposures, manual focus and manual, preferable, bulb settings. This means that light painting will be possible for most modern cameras. That can be a DSLR or mirrorless camera, but also smaller pocket cameras. And if you wonder what camera I use, it's a Canon 5D Mark III. Then we go to the lenses. Any lens can be used in light painting. Just choose the lens that fits the scene you want to shoot. Go wide if you want to shoot a wide landscape, or use a longer lens if you want to focus more onto the details. Whatever lens you choose, you can use it for light painting. Next is our tripod. It really, really has to be a stable one. You don't want any camera movement. The slightest movement of your camera in between shots can ruin the image. Now, in theory, it's possible to align shifted images later on in Photoshop, but it's not easy. Auto align mostly doesn't work when post processing a light painting, so you don't want any camera movement in between shots. Now we arrived at the tool that really distincts classic night photography from our light painting, and that's the flashlight or the torch. For all light paintings, we'll need a relatively strong flashlight. The ones I mainly use are 500 to 1000 lumens strong, and that's quite a lot. Mostly, I use them to shoot medium to larger scenes. Weaker flashlights can be used for smaller scenes. Now, the needed strength of the flashlight depends on several factors. First of all, the aperture you use. Weaker flashlights require wider apertures. Well, you need a strong flashlight to light paint at smaller apertures. Then there's the length of your exposure. The weaker your light source, the longer your exposures will be. And another important factor here is the size of the scene. Bigger scenes require a stronger flashlight, while tabletop light paintings can be executed using a weaker flashlight. The bigger the scene, the stronger the flashlight has to be. Going from 500 to 2000 lumen for a bigger scene, 100 to 500 lumen for a medium scene, and 50 to 100 lumen for a small tabletop composition. The next important feature of the flashlight is the color of the light. Now, there are three main types of flashlights. That's tungsten, LED and xenon. The tungsten emit a warm yellowish light, while LEDs and xenon bulbs will emit a blue or more neutral light. The flashlights that I use are all LED lights, and I prefer the ones that emit a more neutral light. Now, why is the color of the light of importance? As you can set your white balance to whatever setting you want. You can adapt the white balance to your light source and balance it to a neutral color. Or you can choose to set it a bit warmer or cooler. This means that the color of your flashlight doesn't really matter when you're light painting in total darkness. You can choose any light color and change it later on in Photoshop. Now, this all changes when you're doing a light painting that includes some ambient light. That's light coming from another light source than your flashlight. It could be natural light from the setting or rising sun or even the moon, but also any artificial light, like street lights or the glow of a distant city. Now you're mixing two different kinds of light sources. The ambient light and your flashlight. And these two light sources might have a different color. You might want to match the color of your flashlight to the ambient light. This you can do by changing the color of your flashlight. Use a yellow or orange gel to warm the light source, or a blue or greenish one to make it more cooler. The disadvantage of using a gel 
is that it will reduce the intensity of the flashlight and the narrow beam of your flashlight will become a lot wider. Now, I must admit that I don't often use a gel. And when you're shooting multiple exposure light paintings, there are better options. Later on in the field examples, I will go more into detail onto this topic. Most flashlights have a relatively narrow beam and it's possible to modify that beam by using a snoot to narrow it down or a diffuser to turn it into a floodlight. So the ability to zoom or focus isn't really necessary, but it's still a feature that could be useful. Now, I prefer a flashlight with a narrow beam. It gives the opportunity to focus the light onto one spot and enables you to light up distant objects. I own a variety of flashlights, some of them with a wide beam, others with a narrow beam. But if you were to buy one flashlight, I advise you to buy one with a narrow beam. It's more effective to turn a narrow beam into a wider one than to turn a wide beam into a narrow one. Another feature I really want on my flashlight is the ability to adjust the intensity. My Nightcore SRT7 can be gradually adjusted from 0 to 1000 lumen, while my Hyder has three settings, full, medium and low output. Depending on the scene you're working on, you'll need a stronger or a weaker flashlight. The last factor is the durability of the flashlight. The ones I use are quite expensive, but I can rely on them. You don't want to buy a cheap flashlight every other day, spend a little bit more money and get some quality. Next to that, there are some cheaper flashlights on the market that pretend to emit 1000 lumen or even more, but they often promise you more than you'll get. Ok, now we have arrived at the last essential tool for our light paintings. And here you have three options, a cable release, a wireless release or the built-in camera timer. For exposures up to 30 seconds, you can use the built-in camera timer to trigger the shutter. For these shorter light painting exposures, it's a valuable option. A better option is to set your camera on bulb mode and to use a cable or wireless release. A cable release is quite cheap and will allow you to hold the shutter for a longer time. In bulb mode, the shutter stays open as long as you press the button and you'll need a cable or a wireless release to lock the shutter. When I use a cable release, I always wrap the cable around one of the tripod legs. This reduces the chance of camera movement when pressing the button and in darkness it will be easier to find it. Now, the best option is a good wireless release. A wireless release has some advantages over a cable release. When using a cable release, you always have to walk back to the camera to close down the shutter or to take the next shot. A wireless release can be triggered at any position you want. This enables you to shoot a series of exposures without having to walk up and down to your camera, saving you a lot of time. And another big advantage of a wireless release is the fact that you can close the shutter at any position. In this way, you will be able to use your flashlight when walking back to your camera. When using a cable release, you have to walk back in darkness. Other additional gear you might use is a small flashlight attached under your tripod, making it a lot easier to orientate yourself. Quite often, you want to know the position of your camera. I also carry an extra flashlight in my pocket, just for security. It's always possible that your light breaks down or that you drop it by accident. Another important element is your clothing. Best is to wear dark clothes and make sure not to have any reflective parts on them. You don't want to show up in your own light paintings. Additional gear like small light modifiers will be discussed in a later chapter. They're easy to build so you don't have to buy them. 